Right. So if you work really hard on this episode of Cardinals Underground, I'm talking no plays off. You display winning behavior throughout, and you execute, Danny. Then something might happen here today that happened at the end of the Week 2 win against the L.A. Rams. Just like Jonathan Gannon clicked into the headset of Drew Petson and said, hey, good job. Our Jim Omohundro might click into your headset here and pass along a similar sentiment. Because it's not coming from me, okay? Because there's still a lot of room for improvement each and every week here on Cardinals Underground, brought to you by Pacific Office Automation. But maybe, just maybe, from the play caller, you might you might get that certain nod. That was an impressive amount of coach speak in one intro. I, I was just going to say that Paul has always, always come across to me, never gets too high, never gets too low. You know, maybe it's because uh, we just got out of the TV studio recording the coach's TV show. Maybe I'm in that you know parlance, that it vernacular. You can't get too much lower, to be uh, honest. Lexicon, so wow. Not okay, too high that was, that was a failed shot over <laughs> here at Diminutive Americans, who, by my count, uh, let's see, guys under six feet tall, dominated on both sides of the ball. In That's the fair. beat down L.A. that happened in week two. Did they not? They they did. Um I have to say that, and it's funny, every time we talk about it, I remember tweeting out and hearing about it a lot later about how their first half of against the Giants last year was about as good a football as I've ever seen a Cardinals team play in one half. And then what happened in that Giants game? Yeah. Nothing good. Yeah. So that Giants game last year was like the Buffalo game in week one this year. Yeah. 17-3 compared to 28-3. I feel like, I feel like the Giants game was total domination whereas the Bills game was like more of like we're playing keep away from Josh Allen but both those games were either so last Fair. year or That's, so last week I, I would agree with that my point is the whole saying that we have bigger isn't better better is better Buda Baker Kyla Murray better football players than the Rams put out on that field and we're going to go through all this here on Wait, this b- before we get started Uh-oh. though Paul yeah are you in mourning Okay, you're going to have to uh, narrow that down. There's a lot going on these days. I mean, right before we get on the recording here, and and you're a busy man. I mean, Danny and I are just flipping around on social media. Don't speak for me. But, but Paul, you're you're always nose of the grindstone. Did you notice that Marquise Hayes is no longer a Cardinal? I'm being set up here. No, that's not true. That's not. Can I get a lie detector? I'm not. No, that's not true. Are you being serious or, or not? I did not see that. Did not see that. Oh, well, he wow. made a practice squad move. Breaking and news. Marquise oh Hayes was released. You sure he wasn't claimed by another team and made an immediate starter somewhere no, else? No. That was, no? No. Sure. It must be. It, it's sort of a procedural contract, contractual thing. By the end of the week, he'll be back on the roster. Right? I mean, I'm never going to say never. Marquise Hayes might might end up showing back. I, I just noticed yeah. Robbie Chosen was yeah. just dropped from the Miami practice squad. Maybe... Well, Marcus um, Golden was okay. back in the building. Yes. Yes. Junk was down on the sideline. I'm like, dude, where'd this guy, just like Dennis Gardeck, like he was surprising everyone, Marcus Golden, out on that Danny for the was coin toss. Missouri dance thing. Yeah. So it wasn't I, a Missouri dance thing. Well, whatever. So, okay. I'm officially thrown here to begin Cardinals Underground. I see. I knew this was going to be a problem. I, I was not aware a, a, I was going to get ear hold right out of the gate. I guess that's what happens when you get ready for Aiden Hutchinson, who's coming to town. More on that a little bit later. Are you blocking him? Uh, we're going to uh, talk about, among other things in this episode, uh, putting the one into K1. We'll explain that. We're going to revisit the uh, term Honolulu blueprint. How about that? We'll get into that. That is so Paul Calvisi. Wise guy trivia as I get my vengeance. I mean, I thought it was supposed to be football trivia, and last week it turned into TV land trivia. Okay, I didn't appreciate there was that. Football players all over that trivia, Paul. Dan Campbell comps to JG, and that's not us. That's a couple of former Lions and Cardinals players making the comparison. We'll get into that. Dan Campbell's quote about the Cardinals not orthodox. Hmm. And uh, we might have a uh, Paulie Power poll for you a little bit later. So all that straight ahead. Uh, just to share, and Danny, you're smiling over there. Is that still <laughs> is that still the smile from the week two beatdown of of the Rams? It's just the smile of being able to sit across from you at this podcast table, Paul. No, oh, <laughs> again, I'm being set up. See, every time you guys these are compliments, no. Paul. Why don't you take them as they're given? Yeah, and the last time a compliment was given, I was told Marquise Hayes was released. <laughs> okay, it it's always followed up by bad news. That's what happens around here. We care about your feelings, Paul. Okay, all right. So, uh, by the way, if you want to feel better about yourself, I just like throwing out rando stats about the Carolina Panthers. You realize on third 
on third down this year, they're two for 22. I mean, that's entertaining. What? Two for 22 on third down for the Carolina Panthers. They're changing the quarterbacks, yeah, Paul. It's they're addressing gonna, it's it. It's turning around. You know, I'm foreshadowing my power poll a little bit later. So, All right, let's talk about Kyler Murray. And when I say he puts the one into uh, K1, the media, you guys do the, the radio hits and stuff too as well. And you, you know, and all this, in, in the popular question coming off the Rams beatdown, 41 to 10, was, oh, geez, is, is that the best game ever by Kyler Murray? Now, I don't mean to minimize the question. Because honestly, at first, I, I didn't pay much attention. But the more I think about it, that was the best game that Kyler Murray's ever played in the NFL. Agree or disagree? I agree. You know, it's funny. I would have agreed before this morning. But when I ended up... So so this week, uh, the Pro Football Hall of Fame often takes uh, items from achievements that are currently going on from the NFL and put them up in, in, in addition to the hall of famers and all this historical stuff. So they, they took the Jersey and a game ball from this week because Kyler became only the second player ever after Ken Anderson of the Bengals in 1974, who was not a running quarterback, who was not a running quarterback Go ahead. Um, to have at least 250 yards passing, at least 50 yards rushing and a perfect 158.3 passer rating in a game. That is, goes to what you guys are saying, that he's the best. But I will say this. When I was going to look up the last, the only other time Kyler's had something sent to the Hall the hall of Fame for something like this, it was a game ball that he signed from 2022 when he became the only player in NFL history to have a TD pass, a rushing TD, a passing two-point conversion, and a running two-point conversion in the Raiders game. <laughs> Uh, and I went back yes. and looked at that. Okay. I looked at that game story and the stuff and recalling that game, his stats were not nearly as good as what he just had Sunday. I mean, I think in terms of what you hope a quarterback can be, Sunday is tough to beat. But I think back to that. If you want to talk about a guy who singularly won a game for a team, it was that Raiders game. And I don't think given what he had around him and what everybody else was doing, I don't know if he could have played better than that Raiders game. I think that's a really fair argument. Now, I wouldn't have remembered it if it hadn't been for this Hall of Fame thing and I hadn't looked it up, but... What about the season opener at Tennessee when they put a 40-burger on Tennessee? That was pretty amazing. Three years ago. I mean, it's it's known for the Chandler Jones five-sack game, rightfully so, but I, I guess the reason I've come around to contend that this was the best game of his NFL career revolves around more than the box score or the perfect passer rating, the second in team history, only Kurt Warner, our only other Cardinals quarterback to do that. Minimum 20 attempts. It goes to the command and the decision-making. It goes to not just Kyla Murray, best athlete on the field, best game ever, but best quarterback play. And when you think of just how precise he was, the raves he gets from Jonathan Gannon and, and Drew Petzing, going through his reads... And then, I mean, to think when Jonathan Gannon says there was meat left on the bone after that game, think of the incompletions with Marvin Harrison Jr., but just the ability to execute that offense and make it look that easy and be that quick and that decisive. Like, for example, Jared Goff comes into this game with two picks in his last game, easily could have had four or five based on the beat writers who wrote their stories. I didn't see the the game. I'm just, but has Kyler even thrown, knock on wood, a pass that was in jeopardy? of being intercepted this year. You've, Has he thrown one yet? It's funny. I've actually seen a tweet that said he's the only quarterback without an interception-worthy pass yet. Well, like, like that's an analytic? They, they measure like... Uh, I should have known. They, they, whether, so no. Okay. The answer is no. Okay. The, the command was very impressive in the win over the Rams. We know that Kyler can use his legs in a way that many quarterbacks cannot. We also know that Kyler's okay doing that. He doesn't want this offense to rely on that. He doesn't want to be a superhero saving the game the way he did against the Raiders in 2022. This was a perfect outing to see the decision-making of Kyler Murray making the smart decisions of when to hang on to the ball and extend the play and, and make the pass or to run. And and two scrambles stick out in my mind. One when the Cardinals were in their own within their own 20 and he scrambled out to the sideline 
and across his body threw the ball to Marvin Harrison Jr. for, I believe, a 33-yard catch. And the other is the Elijah Higgins touchdown. Kyler scrambled, escaped two sacks in the pocket, and then when he escaped the pocket and, and went out to his left, instead of taking the open space in front of him, he found Higgins, and before Higgins even caught the ball, turned around and celebrated because he knew as soon as that ball came out of his hands, it was going to be a touchdown. Stuff Curry like. The way I mean, K- Kyler Murray finished 17 of 21, 266 passing yards, 59 rushing yards. The command was very impressive, and it helps when your star receivers, your star players on offense, step up in a way we did not see in Week One. It helps when you've got your number one receiver, Marvin Harrison Jr ball out with 130 receiving yards and two touchdowns both coming in the first quarter. I you know I, I just want to add in there too like the 59 yards rushing Paul like is there ever a stat that like underwhelms compared to what your eyes saw? Now again, you don't get rushing yards for scrambling in the pocket before you throw it. But like I look at those 59 yards rushing and right. I it feels like a he ran for more than that and I, and I mean run and B it because it doesn't include the scrambles. Like I, I just, it, it, his stats other than the perfect no. pat, pasture rating didn't feel like it justified. It showed what kind of game that was. That, that That's a valid observation because what did we hear ad nauseum coming off the week one game, the Rams, right? Cooper cup had 430 plus yards of pre snap yeah, yeah. motion because they have the chip in the shoulder pad. So why can't they do that with Kyler Murray? We need a stat like just, how forget how many yards did he rush for? How many yards did he scramble? Like for example, remember the third and sixteen against Atlanta, his debut game in two thousand twenty three a year ago, and didn't he give like thirty yards, and then come all the yeah. way back and gain seventeen for the first down? Like we need more of those stats. I can't believe I'm saying this. More math, <laughs> more analytics, more calculations, but we need more of how many yards Kyla Murray covers on a game to game basis, sort of like a Cooper Cup. If they can do that with Cooper Cup and track his pre-snap motion, why not Car- Kyler Murray just moving around the field before ever he gets beyond the line of scrimmage? It's it's interesting to me though how much how much you want that. Like in a perfect world, he's not having to scramble right. and and move around. Your your guys are coming open early, or the pocket is holding up long enough. And so, so I share this with Craig Grillo and Kyle Vandenbosch on the Red Sea Report, and and I'll just I, I can report that. One of Kyler's chunk runs this year was because the receivers weren't in the right places. The wrong routes were run. Uh Uh-oh. It sort of goes back to— I'm assuming that KVB knew that and Gree didn't, right? Once once you go back—wow, that's a shot. That's uh, that's a low-key shot of Craig Greeley right there. So you go back to the beginning of Carson Palmer and his Cardinals career. And he threw an inordinate amount of interceptions, right, to start his Cardinals career. Mm. And there were people in the media in this town screaming for Drew Stanton to be the new starting quarterback. Yes, they did. Then we found out later. We love you, Drew. Because like Kurt Warner and Carson Palmer, they would never, ever place blame anywhere. They would take everything as their fault. So you never realize that, guess what? It was on the receivers, as we found out later. Well, again, you don't even know how often the receivers are messing things up this early in the season. Yeah. And Kyler's covering, yet still able to execute, still able to have a perfect passer rating. But beyond that, guys, I, I wrote down three questions. Wait, shouldn't this be in the trivia? Maybe. No, no, no. This oh, is about the Cardinals offense. When I, you know, none of the uh, farcical, you know, nonsensical uh, wise guy trivia. We love it, but it's coming our way a little bit later. First, I have to pose the question, what happens if the Cardinals add a legitimate wide receiver one to this offense? A question we posed the whole offseason. I think we got the answer, did we not? Uh, yeah. Nearly 500 total yards out there. A 40-burger on the board. The other one, what happens if you give Kyler a complete offense? We got half an answer to that in 2021 when they started 7-0, and 10-2, and and had a top five running attack. And then the last one, what happens when Kyler is able to keep a defense honest with his legs and his mind? And to me, that's where Kyler separated himself in this game and why I do declare, yeah, best game he's ever played as a pro. It goes back to the decision-making. It goes back to how smart Murray's been with the ball and the throws that he's making. And, and you pair that with his ability to have the strong and accurate arm. 
I was impressed when you're talking about having that complete offense with how the offensive line looked. Because your right tackle, Kelvin Beecham, had a full week now to prepare as a starter. He had to go in the middle of the game week one in Buffalo after Jonah Williams went out with that knee injury. And I thought that they did a nice job. Kyler Murray is still averaging more than three seconds to throw the ball. Wow. And you have, as an offensive lineman, blocking for a quarterback that is as much of a dual threat as Murray is. And to know that the play is never really over and the importance of continuing your block without drawing a penalty is not easy. And this offensive line finds a way to continuously get it done, keep the pocket clean, and give their quarterback time without creating a self-inflicting wound. So when you have that and you have an offensive line that's not only protecting your quarterback and giving him time to go through his reads or roll out and extend the play with his legs, they were also creating some huge gaps. Well, they look huge from the press box. I'm sure it's different when you're James Conner and you're coming out of the backfield. The fact that Conner ripped 10-plus yard runs right off the bat back-to-back, I believe, on his first two carries was impressive. And and that's really what gets this offense going is when you're able to dominate on the ground early. I, I love the point you just made about how the offensive line holds up without getting penalties. This team did has done a nice job uh, under Jonathan Gannon of mostly keeping penalties down. You did not see it a lot against the Rams. And what is – what is one of the biggest reasons why offensive linemen get called for holding? When the quarterback starts scrambling and the offensive lineman doesn't really know where he is and he's engaged in the block and the rusher tries to get away to go get the quarterback who just had, had left and you just naturally hold on a little bit long and you get called for holding, the fact they weren't getting flags, I think that is a tremendous point and I think that's something that uh, the kudos need to go to this line, which, let's face it, there was a lot of people whining, quite frankly, about Kelvin Beach and being in at right tackle. And it wasn't a great situation in Buffalo having to come in. And I think Greg Rousseau is a very good pass rusher. Um, and we're going to see what happens with Aiden Hutchinson this week. But I thought Kelvin Beach and the entire line played very, very well against the Rams. Just the fact, to your point, Danny, and that stat about the time he's had to throw, you don't have a deep game if it's not for time to throw. I mean, look at his four completions to Marvin Harrison, right? 23-yard touchdown, 60-yard touchdown, 15-yard catch, 32-yard catch. And we talked about it in the offseason, did we not? Kyla Murray's not all the way back until the deep passing attack returns. That's when you know Kyler is all the way back, at least in my opinion. First half of his NFL career, he was top three in deep ball percentage and effectiveness and all these efficiency metrics. Last year and a half, before and after the injury, not so much. Bottom three. Now, he's going to be pretty good if Marvin Harrison can get completely uncovered 30 and 40 down, yards downfield. I mean... <laughs> sure, that always helps. He's, it's going to be able to pull that yeah. off. But he was five for five of passes of oh. at least 20 air yards, which doesn't usually happen, number one. And number two, has not happened for this team in a while. By the way, in the 60-yard touchdown, to hear Marvin Harrison tell it, it was 13 personnel. He's the only receiver. Yep. And as soon as Kyler makes a break for it, he realizes, oh boy, I got to help my quarterback out. And he notices there's an opening in the defense. He goes to the open area. Not real tough. Cardinals practice this. The scramble drill as a receiver, you got to make yourself open for a quarterback who's running for his life. If you watch the play, it looks like the original intent was going to be play action, roll to the right, throw back across to Trey McBride. Three players, Rams players, went after Trey McBride, and a fourth was Cam Curl, the safety, who brushes with Harrison heading towards McBride, which is what bumped Harrison forward a little bit and I think just kind of encouraged him to head down the field. So Trey McBride basically got three and a half defenders going his way Worked out pretty well. And in Buffalo, he got a lot of attention. The edge players in Buffalo were chucking him and hitting him right. McBride, you talking McBride, about? Yeah. yeah, they were really going after trying to stymie his release. And they did a pretty good job, you know, knocking him off his route to start. So and he can take that as a sign of respect. He's getting a lot of attention from defensive coordinators two games into the season. But then there was Trey McPlay making quite the catch on, on the sideline. And, uh, his hands are so oh my good. Goodness. And how about yeah. the fumble recovered for a touchdown yeah, that, that, in the his end hands zone? Were good on James Conner was yeah. so close. And yeah. I, you know what? The the Cardinals, I don't 
I don't know if it's necessarily something you can coach or if it's kind of being in the right place at the right time, but both weeks, players have been in the right spot at the right time when a turnover happens. It was Justin Jones in oh, Buffalo, yeah. and then this week, defensive lineman LJ Collier with a recovery, and then Big Bride there in the end zone. What what happened? What happened on that play? Because I'm watching from the press box and I haven't seen the replay, but like Connor goes into the thing, and then the ball looks like it gets shot out of a cannon. He got jacked from behind by 92, a big defensive lineman, 300 okay. plus pound guy that he never saw, and he just just creamed him from behind, like between the shoulder blades, and oh, I'm like almost like the Heimlich. Oh, and so the ball it wasn't, comes out. The ball wasn't punched. Connor was. Connor was, <laughs> and they just the force of this 300 pounder hitting him. Yeesh from behind that he never saw or expected. No wonder James Conner came right back yeah. to the facility for treatment yeah. after the game. It was a jarring hit. There's there's no doubt about it. But, I mean, you look at this Cardinals offense, right? And and then to see Dan Orlovsky right after the game tweet out, Kyler Murray's tape today, top five player in the league tape, and tweet, Dan Orlovsky. I think that's where it started. That's where the narrative started. Was it the best game Kyler's ever played in the NFL? Kirk. Benkert, I think his name is. He's a kind of he was a journeyman quarterback at one point. He gets he's on Twitter now and doing analysis. He tweeted out his quarterback power rankings after two weeks in the NFL. Okay. Number one, Kyler Murray. Wow. Look at that. Look at that. And to think that there was a preseason CBS poll, it was in June, that had the top ten quarterbacks, and Anthony Richardson was eighth, and Kyler was like seventeenth. Yeah, Anthony so, Richardson's. Yeah, it's. Uh, but look, it, it's the entire offense against the Rams. Not only did the Cardinals outplay the Rams, I think they outcoached them. When you have twelve tackles for loss as a defense, when the rushing is two thirty-one to fifty-three, when you have twenty-four first downs, when the Cardinals come out with five sacks, it was both sides of the ball. I just thought. On third downs, Cardinals always had an answer defensively. You know, whether it was a sack, whether it was Buda Baker shooting the gap, they just looked like they knew what was coming. I don't know if Nick Rollis studied that Sean McVay scheme the entirety of the offseason, but it sure looked like it because the Cardinals weren't fooled by much. The Cardinals defense played a sound game across the board. Cooper Cup left the game after the first half. He was uh, out with an ankle injury, and on his six targets, he had four receptions for 37 yards, which even when he was playing in that first half, the Cardinals eliminated him as their top receiver. Now, Matthew Stafford didn't really have many other options to throw to because they were already without wide receiver Puka and Nakua, and they were dealing with some offensive line injuries. That's the name of the game, and the Cardinals were able to take advantage of the weak spots that that Rams offense presented, especially when you've got a pocket passer like Stafford that you know isn't really going to escape the pocket. I thought that there was good coverage in the secondary. Buda Baker had a phenomenal game. It was it was a nice reminder of how strong and physical he is in the open field with those tackles. He He's essentially single-handedly prevented a first down. He was behind the receiver, wrapped up around him, and pulled him backwards so that he didn't go past that down marker. It was a really nice showing by the defense and the fact that the pass rush was active and they were able to get into um, get back there and disrupt Matthew Stafford was was nice to see. I'm sure Dennis Gardick loved getting three sacks in front of his best bud Marcus Golden too. <laughs> yeah, he hit uh, the he hit Marcus Golden's sack celebration yep. that first one. The uh, St. Louis Stomp. St. Louis Stomp. Gotcha. Did you used to do that in college, Danny, at Mizzou? Did you do that? I didn't go to school in St. Louis. Oh, okay. I just, you know, I didn't know if there was like carryover, you know, into the, you know, the whole. Is there a Dallas stomp? No, I didn't go to school in Dallas either. Well, I mean, but you're from Dallas. (laughs) No, there's no Dallas stomp. There's no Columbia, Missouri stomp. No. Dallas dance. The the best part about, you You know. You can chime in, Brian, if you want to. Whether it's Dennis Gardeck. (laughs) Or whether it's Zayvon Collins, whether it's you know hit the strobe or the whole lasso dance, oh yeah, the entire sideline gets into it. I likened it to including yourself. It's like a line dance. <laughs> I want to see that. I mean, it's it's the electric slide at a wedding. Everyone's out there on the dance floor. The whole sideline gets into it. It's good stuff. I mean, Gardeck even waited for that one celebration. He waited one one thousand, two one thousand. Are you looking at me? Making eye contact with the whole sideline. Let's go now. And he like he synced it up. I'm like, what? He's chore- He's a choreographer out there. What's going on at this point? It's all about fun. 
So that's uh, that, that was good stuff, but not as good as as my favorite moment of the game came from the post game, and it was Sean McVay saying, and I quote. There's not anything positive I take from today. It was an incredibly humbling three-hour window. So that's been a long time coming. Was it even a three-hour window? I loved how fast that game went, too. Was it 240, 239? Yeah, I I misspoke uh, earlier on a podcast and said the NFL would never let a game go less than three hours. Didn't have much of a choice. Darren, that was me. You owe me an apology. I said the run game is going to be so prevalent, this game is going to go like 245. Funny how you forgot who well, we, exactly. We, we have a, we have a regular listener who pointed out to me that he was thinking the same thing when you said yeah. that, and then when I corrected yeah. you and said they'd yeah. never exactly do that. Okay, funny how that works over Speaking there. Speaking of time, but that's that's the underestimated thing about I believe about the NFC West. You got to deal with Kyle Shanahan. You have to deal with Sean McVay, both top five coaches in the NFL. You just got done with Coach Double Rainbow. Pete Carroll called it a career, but the whole Pete Carroll culture up there was very effective for a long time, as much as it begrudges us to say it. And now it looks like they got a pretty good young guy in Mike McDonald. I mean, you better have a top-notch coaching staff to compete in the NFC West. And this is just from the outside looking in. I think the Cardinals' two coordinators have taken the leap that Jonathan Gannon said he took from year one to year two as a D.C. in Philly. It looks to me like Drew Petzing and Nick Rawls have done the same thing. I mean, Drew Petzing, his ability, even from week one to week two, the effectiveness of Marvin Harrison Jr., uh, he definitely had Chris Shula and that Rams defense on their heels the entirety of the game, I thought. I think that's why this Lions game is going to be a very good measuring stick for this Cardinals defense. Not to minimize or take away from the performance against the Rams, They were dealing with injuries. And again, you've got an older quarterback who, yes, is accurate and has the the power and the strength, is not mobile. This Lions offense, Goff is not the most mobile quarterback, right? But a little more so than Stafford. And, And Detroit is very balanced. That is another violent, physical team. So I think that this matchup, Detroit's offense against the Cardinals defense, is going to be a good measuring stick when you're looking at divisional opponents in the NFC West and talking about the Seahawks, talking about the 49ers and what those offenses look like as well. All right, here it is, our uh, key to the game. I know it might be a little premature, but the uh, unquestioned key to the game this week is has to be that Lions offensive line, something it's the number one offensive line in the league, trying to keep the pressure off Jared Goff. To your point, Danny, his passer rating last week under pressure, 35. He was miserable. That's when his two picks came, nearly had two other ones. And he's a lot like Matthew Stafford. If you can affect him, you can beat him. So we'll see. Uh, but maybe that's a little bit Captain Obvious, so maybe I should save myself from that. And uh, do I understand it's halftime and uh, it's time for a little time. competition? My time to shine. All right, Danny, here we go. In three, two, one. It's time for The Wise Guy, the world's fastest growing Cardinals quiz show. The stakes are low. The winner gets absolutely nothing. Here's your hostess with a mostess, Danny Sarek. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Since Paul got the first question last week, I feel like we should switch the opportunity to Mr. Darren Urban. That's all right. I'm staring Darren down. He's a lot of pressure today. Darren's not making eye contact. There's like two fighters right before the opening bell, and he's not making eye contact with me. I think I'm. I have the mental edge right now. Did you see uh, the Cardinals uh, MMA fighter? Sugar, sugar, Sean, Sean. Yeah, sugar, he, Sean. He just had to have surgery. Yeah, he's uh, that yeah. didn't go well. I don't know why you're feeling pressure. Yeah. Paul was not yeah. good at this last week. That's true. Okay, it? here we go. First question, Darren. Yes. Anquan Bolden had 10 catches for 217 yards and two touchdowns in his NFL debut against the Lions. It's in not fair. Darren was actually there for that game. Who started at quarterback and running back for the Cardinals in that game? Both answers have to be correct. Whoa. Well, I'm going to go at quarterback. We're going to have the man who said, it's not like I played bad ball. I've only been on bad teams, Jeff Blake. <laughs> That's a great quote. And like at that. running back in 2003, that should have been Emmett Smith. Both are correct. Oh my goodness! I mean, honestly, it was you know, it's you just handed him a layup. I mean, uh, right? Uh, let's go. That's, <laughs> okay, it's, Paul. That I was mean, a great game for Manquan Bolden, wow. everybody. Okay. Here we go, Paul. Ask me about a game I was at. Okay, here we go. In the late 1960s, a movie. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. Here we go. 
A movie called Paper Lion was filmed oh, and released. <laughs> okay, I'm being profiled right now. Here we go. I gotta get through this. It depicted an author's tryout with the Detroit Lions. Alan Alda, that was the actor. Hang on, Paul. <laughs> Several scenes from the film were recorded during a 1967 preseason game against the Cardinals in St. Louis. Name the author and the actor who oh. played him in the film. Oh my God. Well, I just named Alan Alda. Was the uh, was That's the right. actor? That's right. The uh, the the author. Oh my goodness! Come on, Paul. Oh, this is part of my childhood. It's a layup. There were two names that my dad would always talk about. It would be Bobby Lane, 1957 Lions NFL Championship, yeah. and then the whole paper lion thing and the author. And I want to say his first name was Peter, and I can't remember. George Plimpton. Yes, George. yes, George Plimpton. Uh, and fun fact: former Cardinals trainer John Omohandro, so Omo's dad was an extra in the film and wore a full Lions uniform for scenes shot post-game. I did not know that. that Crazy. That's great. fantastic. That's so that funny. is outstanding. So Darren oh gets gosh. the point because he stole it and got it correctly. So 2 nothing. Wow. This is uh, insurmountable, I think, at this point, right? Let's just cool. Let's play it out. I'm playing for pride. Let's go. There we go. Okay, Darren. I like how much pride you have, Paul. It's and amazing Kyler, just how close I've been. In Kyler Murray's 2019 NFL debut, the yes. Cardinals and Lions played to a 27-27 tie. Which former Lion and current member of the Cardinals scored the points that tied the game late in the fourth quarter? Derek Kennard? Oh, did I miss it? Wait a minute. Where's our Where's our X buzzer sound? Yep, incorrect. Paul, you get a chance to steal. Re re repeat oh, the end of the question again. What current Cardinal? Which former Lion and current member of the Cardinals scored the points that tied the game oh, late in the current. fourth quarter? Okay, yeah, that's why I was a little thrown. Okay, uh, okay, then I made okay. Tied nice. the game in the fourth quarter. Well, I feel embarrassed now. Wow. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, Evan Brown. <laughs> He played for the Lions. Maybe he Matt recovered. Prater. Maybe he recovered from oh, oh. oh, for Pete's sake. For Come some on. reason, I didn't. I didn't even think current. That was my bad. Hmm. Here we go, Paul. You're gonna like this question. Wait, is oh no? We're just gonna me. we're gonna keep playing just because okay. we don't get to play the Lions often. That's so. true. Okay, here we go, Paul. Yeah. Lions four-time Pro Bowl defensive tackle. Alex Karras got into acting after his football career ended, playing yep. parts in projects like the Mary Tyler Moore Show. Blazing and Blaze Saddles. Can I finish my oh, question, sorry, please? Go ahead. Blazing Saddles, yeah. thank you. But in the 80s, he found success playing George Papadopoulos alongside Emmanuel Lewis in this hit TV sitcom. See, you jumped the gun, and I had a feeling this is where it was going. Mongo, only pawn in Game of Life. That's his famous quote from Blazing Saddles. Yes. And it's buying me time yes. to come up with absolutely nothing. I don't watch a lot of sitcoms. Webster? Correct. Oh, jeez. So Darren okay. is two and zero oh and Wise Guy. Thanks okay. for playing, everybody. Once again, Appreciate another it, everybody. TV Land edition of Wise Guy. You really got to start watching TV, okay. Paul. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. I got. I need I need to waste more time on a frivolous, meaningless, uh, worthless TV. That's the you lived in Michigan, correct, Paul? I did. Born there. Uh, yes. You were born there. Born there. I did not know that. First certificate so says uh, Detroit, Michigan. Yes. How long did you live there? Till I was third grade, and then boom. I, I lived there until kindergarten gotcha but all my family was still back there yep. so i went back there every other year remember larry foot we had in here yes uh he was incredulous he did not believe either one of us was from detroit yeah, I, like do. He I think was. i remember he that not, conversation. he did not believe that at all yes he didn't believe that so uh anyway yes and my wife is from the d the 313 so you know maybe uh i should have brought in some stroh's beer or the saunders hot fudge or maybe verner's the verner's some fango verner's red Junior, pop yeah, you yeah, know yeah. all the above should have brought all that coney in. island hot dog yes no doubt about it so uh what, okay. What what is coming in though that you need to figure out an answer to is uh, not only Aiden Hutchinson who, who we talked about with the four and a half sacks and right the five quarterback hits. Um, he he's a problem. In fact, Todd Bowles after the game said, "Yeah, he made our life miserable. We tried anything and everything, and we couldn't stop him." And that was Todd Bowles, even though Tampa got the win. Here's my question about the Detroit Lions, Arizona Cardinals in Week Three. We talked about this Honolulu blueprint in the offseason, did we not? If you say so, Paul. If, Darren, as I look past the snark, if you can nail the GM and head coach position, then you know what? You can turn around any situation. 
The Lions just won their first playoff game since Barry Sanders three decades ago. They won the only postseason where they've won two playoff games since they won the NFL title, Bobby Lane, 1957. But they nailed it with the head coach and the GM, Brad Holmes. And there are at least two former Lions, to go back to your trivia, Danny, two former Lions who have played for the Cardinals in the last two years, Josh Woods last year, Evan Brown this year, who we had on the Big Red Rage. And we asked him, do you see similarities, parallels between Jonathan Gannon and Dan Campbell? Cut us off mid-question and gave a resounding yes. Just with their energy, the you know the physicality and violence that they preach, you know, being mentally tough and mentally buttoned up, and just the accountability they bring on all levels. And it, it's just an interesting comparison. And I'll I'll bring it into the present day like this. In his second year, a year ago, it was uh 22 actually, second year for Dan Campbell. They started one and six. A lot of noise, a lot of heat, a lot of pressure, and then they won eight of the last 10, barely missed the playoffs, and we all know what happened last year. They made a run to the NFC Championship. My question to you, when it hits, when it turns, right, you know it. Do you think that win against the Rams just marked the turn, just marked the pivot point for the Arizona Cardinals like it did in the second half of 2022 for the Lions and Dan Campbell? It's hard after talking about how good of a performance that was, but I, I don't know that that's the game I would say that. I think I would even go back to last season and maybe look at the game in Philadelphia and beating the Eagles at home. I think that was a very good showing of what was to come, what we had already seen in terms of the competitiveness and the violence and the motor and the passion that this team was going to have moving forward when you have a general manager in Monty Osborne and head coach in Jonathan Gannon. While this game, the, the win against the Rams, I think showed a lot of what this team can look like when they are rolling on all cylinders. If you're talking about the culture and things changing, I would even go back to Gannon's first year last season and at the end, and despite only being a four-win team, being as competitive as they were. Uh I you know, feel like only thing I would say about that, if you're buying time, is just yeah, you went into Pittsburgh, yeah, you went into Philly, but like the first half against the Eagles was poor, and then they had a ridiculous second half. But it was also a reeling Eagles team that lost five of the last six down the stretch. Uh, the Rams are pretty reeling right now, Paul. <laughs> I I just if if you're gonna talk about but this was a much more point convincing, a, I guess this week to me. I I just feel like you had already been convinced in terms of the culture and the change and hitting a home run with your coach and GM before the season even started. As a quick aside, uh, we have a somebody uh, that works with us who monitors Philadelphia sports radio, especially after an Eagles game. And (laughs) did you know that the Monday night game, the Monday night game where the Eagles just lost at home to the Falcons in painful fashion oh painful uh, that's the first home game they've had since the cardinals went there and beat them last year at oh home. my goodness and somebody made comment of that apparently on wip after the game was like wow. wait the last time the last time you you come here for the fans you lay an egg and lose to jonathan gannon and then you open up this year and do that what is that about i thought that was funny um i i i'm not willing to go all the way and say that this is changes everything basically because of where the Rams are right now. But I think when you look at the landscape of the NFC right now and how the Cardinals are set up and where some of these other teams are and the 49ers have some injuries and uh, maybe some other teams, the Eagles aren't playing as well as people thought they might. I mean, I think the Cardinals are going to be a very, very dangerous team, especially if they can click like that on offense. I, I don't, I don't see them holding a bunch of teams to 10 points, but I do think this offense has a real, real ability here to do the things that they did on Sunday. Yeah. And if they dominate the football, like 37 minutes worth of time of possession, almost, well, it, then, then you know, it, guess what? Your defense uh, is put in a lot better position. The Lions are coming off a loss and only had 16 points, but they did have over 400 yeah, yards of offense. Yeah. So They were miserable in the red zone, one for seven in the red know, zone. Is that is that something your defense yeah. can yeah do like the Buccaneers did. By the way, Dan Campbell on the Arizona Cardinals on his Monday press conference uh, asked about that Jack stomping in the Rams quote. 
That ended up being a lopsided score, but that's the nature of the way that team plays. They are tricky on both sides of the ball. They do a lot of things that are not orthodox. Interesting. Hmm. I asked KVB about that, Kyle Vandenbosch. They said, translate that. Unorthodox? Like when He talked about the personnel groups. Just, you know, what is the identity on offense? Because there's so many different things over the course of the same game. He said, you know, some of the unsound defensive fronts the Cardinals like to use, especially on third down, third and obvious. They'll die a lot of different things up. You know, Buda Baker can be any different position. Mack Wilson Sr., we saw a whole different bunch of different spots almost like a spy on Kyron Williams at a time at times in that game almost like a a running back spy so I I thought that was interesting then he was asked about Kyler and he said when he gets out and runs around Dan Campbell said he's dangerous and now they've got him a weapon to throw to end quote Dan Campbell Trey McBride (laughs) so there you go well uh we'll, we'll see when they come in but look there's no doubt that to me This Cardinals team is patterned a lot like the Lions, and there are just teams that are ultra-physical. Cardinals are one of those teams. Lions are one of those teams. The 49ers are one of those teams. And, I mean, it's Wolf isn't going to sit down the entirety of this game. There will be a tear in his eye for four quarters when when this bloodbath. Does he ever sit down? Doesn't he always stand? I, I don't know. I'm 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 down uh, grinding on the sideline. I, I I have no idea. I've never Paul's been doing in the all booth. the sideline yeah. dances. Yeah. Well, well, oh, that's right. I forgot. Well, Wolf's enjoying climate control and the uh, halftime buffet. Uh, you know, we're down uh, ham and egger uh, down on the sideline for that one. So you know, speaking of not knowing where some of these teams are going in the wide openness of of the league right now, a quick update. Uh, after my wonderful first week of picks, I nose dove. <laughs> And I'm now tied with you, Paul. Oh, really? And I'm really? two games back. And you're two okay. games back. Danny uh, and I each went seven and eight on picks this week. You went nine and six. Interesting. Okay. So now you and I are right. 19 and 11 each on the year. Yeah. Danny we, is 17 and 13. We did get the uh, we did get the Tampa win over the Lions. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not... actually surprised I did as well as seven and eight. But did I you guys pick Buffalo that. over Miami I in Miami? Miami? No. I did. I did have that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. The uh... by the way, what is the latest on the Dolphins? So. So think about this. Christian uh, McCaffrey gonna miss and Debo Cardinals Samuel. Game. Christian are... McCaffrey is definitely going to miss the Cardinals game in week five. Debo Samuel isn't on IR. Uh, Kyle Shannon said that he will miss, quote, a few weeks. Now, some other people are seeing a couple. The Cardinals play them in three games. So Debo Samuel is going to be right on the cusp. And then uh, Tua for the Dolphins just went on IR with his concussion. The earliest he could come back off of IR, if he came back that first game back, would be the Cardinals game. Interesting. Okay. Okay. All right. By the way, did I get your uh, comments on Marvin Harrison Jr.? Did we uh, do enough of a deep dive? Was there anything else you wanted to say about the guy who, after one quarter of play, speaking of Anquan Bolden in his rookie debut, was tracking in week two to do what Anquan Bolden did in week one? Of his pro career. It would have been nice to see him catch those other two fade touchdowns that were both open. I thought they were both going to connect. Yeah, They will, though. And to me, that was shades of fits in that Marvin, I I believe, was thinking more about what could have been than what was after the game. Like the missed opportunities because there were several. the first thing he said. Yes. And, And then the other thing made me think of Larry, I'll be honest with you. He got near the goal line and he went beast mode. He wasn't going to be denied. He lunged for that pylon and that goal line. I'm like, no chance, and he made it. And that was sort of like Larry, especially the latter part of his career. Hey, is that KJ Wright, all-pro linebacker, between me and the goal line? Sorry, KJ. Boom, and he just truck him. Harrison was dominant, and he refused to be phased by the defenders. That first touchdown pass, which was so perfectly thrown by Kyler Murray, yeah. and I don't think that can be stressed enough right now to the back end of the end zone. And there was a defender who had his hand in Harrison's face. The the defender's hand is in between Harrison's hands as he is catching the ball and he still makes the catch. And on the second touchdown, as he's getting tackled, full extension to go past the pylon. It it was a spectacular outing by Marvin Harrison Jr. and, And a really great rebound from week one, his NFL debut in Buffalo, where he had just one catch for four yards. Well, like I said, he... He could have had a seven-yard touchdown and a five-yard touchdown. I thought both those were open in the two of them. I thought the first one was not a great throw by Kyler. I thought the second one Marvin probably could have had and couldn't come up with it. And then there are the other two incompletions. 
you know, Kyler only had four incompletions. All the targets were to Marvin. Yeah. There was the first pass of the game, which was just low. I thought it was low. It was a weird kind of pass, and I, I think it was broken up, but didn't have much of a chance. The other one, Marvin was wide open, 20 yards downfield, and Kyler just airmailed it. Otherwise, that's another 20-plus yeah. yard gain. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Realistically, feasibly, two months from now, all three that you just cited. Agreed will be complete and yes agreed that that's when you get the true realization of what wide receiver one can do for this offense the only downside i think is you know you didn't get to play bryce young in carolina you know early in the year before andy dalton came in well here's the question paul and i i pose this to some other people in the office including danny is bryce young starting for the panthers when the cardinals go there right before christmas maybe you never know with Carolina, that is you a have lousy no idea. answer. You have no idea. Yeah, maybe. No yeah. crap. Yeah. Uh, what I will do is I will give you, um, in honor of Bryce Young and Carolina, I'm now going to give you a, a Pauly Power Poll uh, ranking recent incompetence and ineptitude in our world. Okay. I'm not going to explain all these. Some are football, some are just current events. If you're not keeping up with current events, then you know I'm, I'm not here to explain it. But here's our, our, our rando power poll of incompetence okay. in recent memory. Okay. Number one, Alex Morello ruining, uh-huh, running the Coyotes. Okay. Does that mean it's the worst or we're, we're yeah, just getting toward? Examples of abject incompetence. Oh, this incompetence. is not in a particular order. No, these are yeah. just, okay. Secret service times two. Mm. Harrison Butker. Mm. Kid Rock lip syncing at the RNC. You had to see it to believe that. The uh, Trey Lance trade, uh, that's that's still there in, in the ether. Uh, you know, three, The 49ers one, right? Yes. Not the Cowboys one? <laughs> right, three round one picks, right? I don't know, the Bryce Young trade. Yeah. Uh, how about uh, the Pac-12 commissioner's office, times two, Larry okay. Scott and George Klyovkov. Endless shrimp at Red Lobster, which bankrupt Red Lobster, that promotion. Hanrahan up in uh, marketing. Sad. That was sad. I know Paul went to Red Lobster yeah. quite a bit. Uh, I'm going to put the Bryce Young trade um, where you gave up two first rounders and two second rounders to move from nine to one, and then you bypassed C.J. Stroud. So, I mean, there's three levels of incompetence well, there. I'm, uh, the, the only thing I'm going to say is I think most people had Bryce Young ahead of C.J. Stroud at the time of the draft. Uh, it's number two, and then the number one, uh, the most flagrant or egregious example of recent incompetence and ineptitude would have to be the Australian breakdancer at the Olympics. How about that? Uh, Ray okay. Gun. Ray Gun, Ray yes. Gun. So there you go. That's my, You're a hater. That's my power poll. Of- I have one little thing I want to bring up. and I Well, just, I didn't show up with anything. Well, you, you can come up with something <laughs> while, you're, while we're talking. So Sidney Crosby just signed another contract with the Pittsburgh Penguins, right? Okay. Sidney Crosby, who is no longer probably the best player in the NHL, but he's probably still top yeah. three. Darren, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Okay. <laughs> you don't care. No, I, I thought he retired like years ago. No. How old is he? He's in his late 30s, but he's still really good. He's not even 40. No. And he's still no. A viable That's what happens player. when these guys come into the league at 18. That's true. That's right. Sidney Crosby yeah, he debuted at 14. You're so, right. But what I found was incredible was since 2008, 2009, his cap hit, has always been $8.7 million. Now, there's been a couple years where he's gotten paid a little bit more, but this guy was the best. Pl- when that first started happening, he was the best player in the league, and he's never been paid as the best player in the league. He's he's There's always a lot of guys who are ahead of him because he was born on August 7th, so he wants his cap hit to equal... Eight seven, which by the way, I was born on August thirty first, and if we're doing this for me, I want eighty three point one million dollars, not eight point three one <laughs> million so, dollars. So, I mean, there's being superstitious, and then there's being idiot stitious. I mean, what, what, why would he not? Does want, that go the, on your poll? The I most mean, he ever made. Right. In, you know what? That's great, Danny. That's a great yes. That, that comes full well, circle. That makes yes. sense. Yes. Right mo- in between Bryce Young and Ray Gunn. He did make twelve million dollars a couple of years, but he's never made more than twelve million dollars a year. And I know NHL salaries aren't quite the same as some other sports, but I was looking it up, and like he since like. 2012, the leading guy in the league has gotten like $14 million a year, and he's taking like. I mean, that is so lot, random. Like, Why were you looking that up? What, what, what in the same? Oh, uh, the, because he just signed a new contract oh. and he did it again. <laughs> and they're like, he's had, he's made $8.7 million a, a year first player. since 2008. I'm like, what? Who was the D back who was getting $1 million a year for 25 years? Was that Bernard Gilkey? 
Is that yeah, sort of like the same the sort Bobby of deal? Bonilla the, uh, the, uh, Bobby Bonilla thing? No, right, the whole it's thing? not quite the same thing no? because... There isn't like deferred this money isn't and deferred he's not going to get the is, rest of his salary and again, later. Sidney Crosby is still one of okay. the best players out there. It's like LeBron taking right. a pay cut. Oh, wait, he didn't do that. I mean, what in the Sam name of Mario Lemieux and Yarmer Yager are you doing, Sidney Crosby? Sid the kid, what's going on? By you the should way, be paid uh, accordingly. When I was looking up the details on this, I also saw the Pittsburgh Penguins actually have players go to season ticket houses and deliver their season tickets, including Sidney Crosby has done that. And imagine, depending on the players, some of the house residents don't even recognize the players because they always have their helmets on. Maybe. But I think if they're wearing their show jerseys, mm. they have a pretty good idea. By the way, I was just informed that the Bryce Young trade was not only first round picks, two of them, two second round picks, there was also DJ Moore, the yeah, wide DJ receiver. Moore. So I'm going to vault that ahead of, of Sidney Crosby. DJ Moore, who, know. by the way, looked like he was going to just kill himself getting non passes oh, from Caleb Williams. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's. Uh, um, okay, well, I didn't think we'd get uh, the TV Land trivia for a second week, and I did certainly did not think we would get the Pittsburgh Penguins trivia here at the end of Cardinals. What, when's your birthday? What, what would your what would your no, average salary be, that, Paul? That's classified. I don't info. need a year. I just it's need a cla- day. It's, it's uh, it, it would be two nineteen would be so. Uh, obviously, that would be you know move that decimal point just over yes. one twenty one point nine. You know three eleven. Three eleven. Isn't that a band? Hmm. It okay. is a band. Okay. And, and you just, you did the fact Danny didn't know and you wondered. Yeah. And our Jim Omohundro has been to 17 of their concerts. Oh, so I think he just took that personal. And I'm going to buy you some time the to get window out the was, side door. If, if the window was the other way looking out, I'd yeah. be able to tell. Yeah, that's right. And uh, that last insult will do it here for Cardinals Underground, brought to you by Pacific Office Automation.